Reconciliation centers around restoration, healing, and taking responsibility. With the recent heartbreaking discoveries happening across Canada involving the death of thousands of Indigenous children at residential schools, we as a country are at a period of important self-reflection. An important part of that reflection begins with the learning about our country's past. Our next guest is here to speak with us about the importance of Indigenous stories. As a leader in the media industry, he consistently advocates for the importance of Aboriginal arts and what reconciliation really means to him. Let's take a look. Jesse Wente. As an experienced film critic and Canadian broadcaster, Jesse Wente is confident in speaking his mind. Primarily known as the first syndicated Indigenous columnist for the CBC, Wente is proud of his Ojibwe ancestry. Throughout his career, he has dedicated his time to advocate for Aboriginal arts, stressing the importance of depicting Indigenous characters in film in a dignified way, while also including strong Indigenous voices in the creation process. After becoming the executive director of the Indigenous Screen Office, Wente continues to work on films that focus on stories of resistance and family truth. Jesse's message of inclusivity should be pushed to the forefront as Indigenous stories are continuously overflowing with messages of beauty, authenticity, and courage. Ah, Ani Bojo, thank you so much for uh, having me here today and Elevate. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. It says on the big uh, teleprompter, Jesse Wente, no script. <laughs> That's probably how I uh, prefer it, uh, to be honest. I've thought a lot about uh, what to say to you today, because there's a lot that I could probably say. Uh, I've decided to start by telling a story, though, if that's OK. The, the panel, they, they named the panel the same thing I've named my book. Uh, Unreconciled, Family, Truth, and Indigenous Resistance. So I'm actually going to tell a story uh, from the prologue of the book. So if you've read it, sorry. If you haven't read it, spoiler alert. Um, so when I was about 10, I grew up in uh, East York uh, of Toronto, which uh, some of you may know it's that way, I think. Um, uh, grew up there pretty much my entire life. We moved there when I was two from the beach, which was adjacent to East York, so not exactly a huge geographic uh, move. And um, I played like pretty much all the kids at the time. We played in the local softball league every summer. Uh, there was a park, Topham Park. Uh, it's got three diamonds on it of varying sizes, you know, from T-ball all the way up to the men's league that would play under the lights. And, you know, all the neighborhood kids would play. My dad was a coach. Uh, all the parents would come out and watch. It was very 70s and 80s, very sort of that style of, of Canada. And uh, we played in the league for a few years by, by this time. Again, I was, I think, around 10 when this uh, happened. And if, if you've ever played in one of these leagues, you know that uh, taunting the opponent is one of the things you do just as a matter of, of course. And at the time, granted, it was an innocent age. Uh, the taunts got about as bad as, we want a pitcher, not a belly itcher. A damning rebuke, I know. But uh, that was about the level that we were dealing with uh, at the time in Topham Park. And um, on this day, it was just a normal game on a weeknight. Uh, you know, nothing extraordinary uh, about it. I was in the uh, on-deck circle, waiting my time at plate. I was, uh, I like to think, better than average as a player. As you can tell, I'm big. So I could, if I hit the ball, it would go a long way. So that was always good. And as the, I can't even remember what the person up the plate did before me, because it's really, this is Topham Park softball. None of it mattered in the scope of sports history. Um, so I, it was my turn at bat, and as I came up, I heard the other team start to taunt me. But it was not a generalized taunt. The, you know, the, the belly itcher, you could, you could attach that to any pitcher, regardless of quality, anything. They could all get that stung on them. This particular taunt, though, 
was actually only ever reserved for me from then on. I was the only kid that would hear this particular taunt at the uh, ballpark. And I should repeat, I went to school with most of these kids. These were kids that would have attended my birthday party at some point in my, my life. Their parents would have known my parents. My dad would have been their coach at some point in their uh, lives. They would have maybe rode with me a big wheel up and down the big hill beside my, my house in the summers. So these were not strangers to, to me or my family. So when I came up to plate, they made this very specific taunt just for me. Uh, and I'll do it for you now. I don't, I don't uh, like it, I got to admit, but I'll do it. And I ask you never to do it. Uh, but I'll do it now just so you can understand. And uh, I suspect some of you have probably heard it, uh, depending on where you uh, played any minor league sports. But anyway, it went something like this. They did that when I came up to the plate. Now, interestingly, I knew exactly what they were saying when they taunted me with that sound, even though I have never heard that sound outside of that incident, save for maybe Saturday morning cartoons or some Western movies of a certain vintage. You would have heard that taunt. But they made it for me, and I knew exactly what they meant. And I bet you know exactly what they meant, too, when they made it, which is that I was an Indian, and they knew I was an Indian. That's about as much as they knew, I would guess. Because if they knew anything about Indians, A, they would know you don't call us that. B, you would know that that sound is not a sound we make. I've been like, again, I'm, I'm Anishinaabe. I grew up First Nations in a First Nations family. You know, uh, never heard that sound at the, any, I was gonna say dinner table. What a ridiculous sound to make at the dinner table. But I've never heard that sound anywhere. I've never heard that sound in my community. Now that I have had the privilege to tour the world and visit indigenous communities all over the planet, never heard it there either. The only place I've ever heard it is on that ball diamond and in the movies and cartoons that those kids also watched with me. But that's it. And it has struck me, a few things strike me about this incident. It's why I, I opened the book with it. Um, one, I don't, I don't, as you have figured out or I've told you, I don't remember anything about the games that happened on that diamond. Not a thing. I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you what I did at that at bat. Like, I hope I hit a massive home run and there was like wild cheering. I don't think that's what happened. Uh, I would like to think that though, but I just don't even remember. I do remember the, that noise though. I do remember that sound that they made. That's maybe one of the things I remember most of my childhood growing up in East York. Because wouldn't, that wouldn't be the only time I would hear it. Uh, it would, again, it was reserved for me for that season. So every game that season, I would have heard it. My sister, when I've told this story, she says, I remember a time even before then, on the playground, playground during school, during recess, where all the kids had surrounded me making that noise, and she stood outside the circle and just didn't know what to do when they, shoot, when they were making this noise. Now, so lots of things I think about this. One is this is probably the only thing those kids knew of First Nations people when they made that noise, even though it's a fake thing. So we'll get to that part, that what they knew was not real. We'll get to that. But more importantly, maybe, what strikes me is they were on the field with an actual First Nations person. Like, I was right there. They could have touched me. Many of them would have at some point. And yet, none of that meant anything in that moment. Like, the fact that they never heard me make that noise didn't matter to them, right? This was, this was an insult, right? So that's the other thing to keep in mind, is they were telling me I was an Indian, and that was something that was insulting meant to be bad. It's a message my family's heard quite a lot, frankly, over the years. Uh, and not just on the, uh, the ball diamond. So that's always struck me. It's always struck me that none of the adults said a damn thing that entire season. I've none of the adults, and I, my, that includes my parents. 
None of them ever remarked on this, on this. It didn't go away. It wasn't a news item on CBC. It was totally accepted, no problem, fair play on, on the diamond. Again, I don't remember anything about the games. I remember the chant. So how fair play was it that that's what sticks with me? And the other thing that, that I think about and I write about in my book, so again, spoiler, is that um, in 2018, there was a hockey team called the First Nations Selects hockey team, made up of, you can imagine, First Nations boys playing hockey. So they went to a tournament in Quebec City in 2018, and they heard the exact same noise I heard 30 years previous made by kids and their parents at the hockey rink that day. And it was national news. You can go Google the article now. It struck me, because 2018 is like not that long ago. I don't know if we're clear. I realize I'm old, but 2018 is not old. Um, it strikes me that I would have expected or hoped that non-Indigenous people would know more about us by 2018 than they did in, say, 1984. But still that sound was made as, an, as a targeted insult taunt. So maybe they don't know any more than they knew in 1984. Um, and I do worry that those kids that played in that game, just like me, when they're older, and they were, these are high-level hockey players. This is not just some neighborhood team, but I do worry that for some of them, what they'll remember is the sound and not what, they've, what they accomplished on the rink, on the ice. And so I, you know, it was mentioned that we're in a moment of reflection. I'd sort of ask all of you to reflect a little bit whether you think we are, where we are versus 1984, if the taunt was still used three years ago, and how far we've actually We've actually come. You know, my grandmother uh, would attend those games. Uh, she lived across the street. Is it okay if I get some water? I, I don't actually care if it's okay. I'm just going to do it because um, it says no script. So, um, my grandmother, uh, she, when we moved to East York, we moved to East York because my grandparents lived lived there. Uh, so my grandmother Norma and my grandfather, Jack, they lived literally across the street from us when we were in East York, so they would often come to the games. And I can't remember if she was there uh, that night. She would have absolutely been there for one of those games that year, though. And we never, she never brought it up. Um, it was not a, you know, the only person that ever brought it up in my family was me just a few years ago. It was not a story I talked about a lot previous to that. In fact, I think I brought it up because of those kids at the, on the hockey rink, just to say that this has been ongoing. But anyway, my grandmother, Norma, she would have attended one of those games. Um, Norma Miyawasagi was my grandmother uh, on my mom's side of the family. She was my mom's mom. And she grew up, she was born in Ganabajing, which is on the north shore of Lake Huron. Uh, it's now called the Serpent River First Nation. And she would have been born there in the late 20s. So around, you know, there's some dispute over when she was born. But anyway, the late 20s is a, is a good enough uh, shot at it. Um, so in the 20s, uh, well, let's put it this way. In 1920, the Canadian government passed a law that made it mandatory for all First Nations children to attend residential schools. So by the time my grandmother was born, her scholastic future was sort of already determined. Uh, so she would go into St. Joseph's School for Girls in Spanish, Ontario in 1933 when she was six years old. And she would be there for 10 years. They allowed her, uh, the kids at Spanish could go home during the summers. Uh, for some of the schools, they, were not, they wouldn't go home. And some were day schools where they would go home every, every day. Uh, for you know, the, the schools in Spanish, and there were two schools in Spanish, Ontario, a boys' school and a girls' school, uh, that had been there since the 1800s, 1860s. Um, 
so she would go there for 10 years. So all the pictures I have of her, we, we have of her, are during the summer, because that's when she was home with her, her family. Uh, she went in at six years old. She really only spoke uh, Anishinaabe Moan, so her traditional uh, language. Her parents had already converted to Catholicism, so they uh, saw the schools, or they believed the idea of the schools that they would allow her to learn new skills, learn this new language, really be able to be a success in this uh, new world. They had been led a very traditional life. He had been a trapper who sold furs to the Hudson's Bay Company, and she was the medicine woman and the midwife for the community. So they knew that sort of life was over, and they were trying to prepare their children for what would uh, come. So she spent 10 years in the school. When she came out, she no longer spoke her language, and she no longer told those stories. Uh, she wouldn't really talk about what happened to her in the school. You can certainly look up at the uh, National Center for Truth and Reconciliation website if you want more details of what happened at the schools in Spanish. Some survivors did testify about what happened there, and they were fairly notorious schools. Uh, we, we, we should soon stop calling them schools, I think, uh, here. Because I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing, you know, when she went in, um, the idea of what an a, a indigenous woman could become, what her career prospects might be, were pretty limited. So they really taught you in those schools, if you were a girl anyway, um, to be a domestic servant. So, you, so and that's what she was. When she, she came out, she moved to Toronto. She was very ashamed of who she was by the time she came out. Um, so she moved to Toronto where she kept house for her families and then became a server at a, a downtown club, not far from here, uh, actually, called the Albany Club, which is Canada's oldest private club founded by, irony of ironies, John A. Macdonald, uh, where I'm sure many of the people who've worked uh, in buildings very close to this or attached to this one have, uh, will probably go tonight, to be honest, if it's open. I don't know anything about it. But she worked there for, for 30 years. Um, uh, when she moved to Toronto, she told people she was Italian, which uh, is tragic, because of course she's not, but it's comical to us, because uh, who would have bought that story? If you've ever, if you see photos of my grandmother, <laughs> never met an Italian uh, who looked, I mean, I don't know how south she thought in Italy you could go, but, um, or north, to somewhere, anyway. Um, but when, by the time I grew up, uh, you know, we weren't, we weren't pretending anymore. I, I've never n not known that, who I was or where, I, where our families uh, uh, come from. Um, but it was, you know, what happened to her there uh, is why my family ultimately moved to Toronto, why we were even in, in East York for those uh, softball games. Um, and I think that's one of the things that is a struggle for Canadians in this moment. And in this moment, I mean um, for as long as Canada's been around and probably, I'm guessing, for a few more generations, sadly. Uh, one of the, the struggles has been um, that the residential schools, you know, they were very, for sure they were about making sure my grandmother lost her language. And yes, they did teach her to speak English and all of that. Uh, when she would speak her language, the nuns would hit her tongue with a ruler to make sure they, she wouldn't do it again. Um, and so, um, so it was very much about getting her to stop and teaching her, teaching her forcing her to speak a different uh, language. Um, but I think the struggle for Canadians is the acknowledgement and the realization that it was also done to ensure that I would not speak my language and that my children would not speak my language and that they would not know their culture. And that attacks on the family and children are about that. They're actually not about what is going on in the moment. They're about erasing that family and their history from that point forward. This, me speaking to you like this today, is very much an unintended outcome of residential schools. Me speaking the way I am today in a foreign language to me people on the territory that we've lived on for 13,000 years, that is very much an intended 
outcome of residential schools, right? The, the sound I heard on that ballpark, that, that grotesque noise, the same one that those kids heard in 2018, and all the fact that that's what I remember, that's also an intended outcome of the residential schools. Because you, I'm sure you've noticed, if you've, if you've studied it at all, that curiously, there aren't any residential schools in cities where your ancestors might have seen them and witnessed them. They're all out there. You've also probably noticed there's no urban reserves in Canada. Isn't that interesting? As if there weren't indigenous people here all along. Because in fact, the reason why settlers settled where they did in what we now call cities is because, of course, there were already people there. In, in community. It's not that these were new things. These, you know, people should know, like Toronto's where all the, the rivers exit into the lake, right? So we all gathered here for like millennia. So it's not a surprise that you two settled here. But there, it is very intended that our reserves, Serpent River, because again, the Anishinaabe Nation stretched for most of Ontario, well into Minnesota and the American Midwest, but my people are on a small little acreage, 350 of them on the north shore of Lake Huron, far away from your eyes because they never wanted you to know us. Their, the whole goal was that we would be gone before you ever got here. And then you could live in the comfort of never knowing. And instead, we're faced with the discomfort of this moment and the moments yesterday and the moments that will happen tomorrow and I think that has made um, reconciliation hard in Canada. And I think it's, it's less, I don't even think we've got to the reconciliation part. I think the reality for Canada is that the truth, because you can't separate these two things, because what are we reconciling is the truth. So if you just say reconciliation, I don't know what that means. I, but I think the truth part is really hard for Canada to grapple with. Right? It's hard to grapple with what happened to my grandmother and my family because there were eight kids in my grandmother's generation. Five of them went to residential schools. The youngest three, by that time, my great-grandparents had figured it out. And so they had to leave. They moved off their reserve so the Indian agent wouldn't come. So let that sink in. To save their children, they had to leave their community. That is also an intended outcome of this whole thing. It was meant to break us apart. And it used children because that is a really quick way to do it. The other way, war and all those other things, Canada has lost its taste for, sort of, on its, its own territory. We don't mind going to other places and killing indigenous people over there, but here, we like to pretend we don't do that anymore. But the truth has, has been the struggle. And I think one of the things I want to say about truth-telling, or, or truth in general, is that there's two parts of it to truth. There's the telling of the truth, which I would suggest to you and everyone watching the world, that First Nations and Métis and Indig uh, Inuit folks have been telling our truth for a very long time at this point. Because the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which started in 20, 2007, and wrapped up in 2015, its findings mirror the exact same findings of something called the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, which occurred 20 years previous, in the 90s, but was completely ignored. And likewise, the final report of the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls inquiry found very many of the same things. The issue isn't that the truth has not been told or that it is hidden. That is not true in Canada. The challenge in Canada is that the truth has not been accepted, and that's the other part. We can tell the truth all we want. I could stand here, I could show, I could have brought pictures of my grandmother in the school. I'm not sure what it would, difference it would make at this point. Uh, I think more is what we need for Canadians is to accept that this is what happened. And unfortunately, we are not there. I wish we were. But the reality is, even with you know, there was reference to, uh, I don't call them discoveries, because they're not for our community. 
the, the graves of these children. There was a graveyard, by the way, built when the schools were constructed in St. Joseph's, just as there were at virtually every residential school, because they knew the children would die there. That was also an intended outcome of the schools. And yes, and here's where I get to the point where the truth can't be accepted. If you read some of our national newspapers when these uh, confirmations of these grave sites were made, what did you see in the editorial pages? I saw people talking about the rates of tuberculosis and how that was just nothing we could do about these, these children. Um, they ignore that I haven't found a graveyard in any of the urban schools ever in Canada. My daughter goes to Central Tech, one of the oldest schools in Toronto. I don't remember there being a graveyard there. So there's that. Um, they miss the fact that children in residential school died at a higher rate than Canadian soldiers in World War II. There is no tuberculosis stat you can throw at this that makes this a thing that is real. It's just not. But that's what we saw in the papers. We know there's, there are senators, or at least there was, uh, she thinks she's still there, that don't believe that this is what happened. We have political parties that win what I would suggest to you is should maybe be a somewhat disturbing percentage of the vote in Canada who deny that this is a thing that Canada has to own up to or be involved in. So we need to accept this because it's only in the acceptance of this that we actually can agree that we're now moving forward on a same history, that we're, we're agreeing that this is what happened, that a harm has been done, right, and that and then between truth and reconciliation, I think we're missing a part, which is amends or restitution, or as some of my cousins call it from other racialized communities, reparations. Because if you think of literally any personal relationship you have where someone has done enormous harm to you, again, think of whatever harm you can in your head, but I've you know, you, we, there's finding graves at schools. So think of that harm and think of what it would take for you to then agree that you can now reform a relationship. Is apology enough in that? I don't think it is. I think there actually has to be a making of good, a, a restitution, an amends made before we can get to reconciliation, which is about how do we actually have a relationship on these lands, which we now share, but we should start to admit maybe the way we have shared them is not the way we need to move forward with it if we start to acknowledge the truth, if we are willing to accept the truth of this place, right? Which is, and we all know the truth, because I assume you've all taken one history class. Like, you know that these places, and I, I'll, I'll be generous and include, oh, I'll just say the truth, it's not me being generous, I'll include the other settler off countries, like the US or Australia or New Zealand, much of Africa, you know, those places that were quote unquote settled as part of European colonialism 500 years ago, right? All of these places at one point or another, in their founding, the myths about themselves that they were founded for equality, and for equity, and so that everyone would have equal opportunity. Yet we all know in this room, and I assume everyone watching, that if you go literally look at the founding documents of these places, these are exclusionary documents, not ex inclusionary. They spell out who isn't allowed to be engaged, and they spell out who is. And it turns out it's mostly white male property owners. How far have we actually drifted from that reality that white male property orders aren't still the center of our political system, right? We, we, we see our politicians refer to taxpayers. Who do you think they're talking about? That's who they view as their base. But if we look and then we know that women didn't have the vote when these countries were founded, we know that racialized people weren't allowed to vote when these places were founded. We know we can go look 
It's, you don't even need Google, look up any Canadian history book. We know indigenous people in Canada did not get the vote until 1960. So what are, all of that is made up. So if we, if we can acknowledge that democracy didn't arrive in these places until like roughly 60 years ago, not 150, not 500, 60, like there's people in this room that are likely older than democracy in Canada. Okay, if we can grapple with that, then we're not changing some grand tradition. We're changing something that in our lifetime has come to be. So we shouldn't be that daunted by the, the task ahead. But we do need to accept the truth of what, of, of these very simple, very, I can show you the paper that it is written on truths, right? If we can't, I realize we're in an, media ecosystem and a storytelling ecosystem where even things written on paper that you and I witness with our eyes, some will deny that those things are true, but I'm asking the reasonable folks that I assume we are here, if you read it on a paper, this is what happened, right? Uh, when, they, when the graves are confirmed, there's no point in denying. And one of the things I've learned, you know, my community it was about three weeks ago now. They held a ceremony in Spanish, Ontario, on the site of the two schools. And they held the ceremony uh, with the other nations who had children attend those schools. They held the ceremony because it's our custom that we don't disturb grave sites. Uh, and so we have to ask the children who are there permission to search. It will take a lot of a, a time. We know there are kids there. I to already told you there was a grave there, a marked grave. I should say that they took all the headstones down when they closed the school. And they burnt all the records for the school, the church did. Um, so while we know that the priests and the nuns who worked there, we don't actually have a, a, a full record of who attended there. We only, that's only verbal history. Now again, why would you do that? Would you burn records? You all know the answer to why you would do that. To make sure that this would never happen. That one of their descendants would stand on a stage and tell you that this is what happened. But tough shit, it's happened. So they burned the records, but they didn't burn us. So we're still here. So though this is part of my obligation to my grandmother is to tell the story. Part of my obligation to my community. Because you people are so nice to invite me here. This is, this is what I have to, I have to do so it's not it's not forgotten. So they went and they did the ceremony to ask. And I think one of the things that should settle in for Canadians is that these confirmations are going to continue for years. For years. So there will be no possibility at pretending that this isn't a thing that happened. You're just not going to be able to. You were never going to be able to, is the truth. So the longer we keep arguing over whether to call these schools, whether these were good, whether this ever happened, we just delay what is, is inevitable. And it's also our teachings that the children are coming now because our communities, actually doesn't have much to do with yours, sorry, but our communities are ready for this. We are in a place, as hard as it is, to bring the children home after all these years. That's how long it has taken our communities, our families, to prepare for this moment. But it is here. Our communities are ready. I think what you're feeling and what you're witnessing is that Canada isn't ready for this. But again, I don't think we care. Because when we're talking about reconciliation in Canada, what are we reconciling? Yes, the TRC was specific about the schools. So for sure that. But we all know that the schools were just part of a large policy where the policy goal was no more Indians. None. That's why the sports teams all made us into mascots before 1920. They assumed that we wouldn't be here to complain about it. And much like the Spartans or any other long past group, 
who can then become a mascot for all things heroic, they figured, oh, we'll, we'll call them, we'll call all these people this, which is why I would suggest those kids felt it was okay to boo, is because they had seen, they watched sports on a Saturday, they saw mascots, they saw fans do the exact same ch chance. Heck, if you're a Blue Jays fan, you've probably attended playoff games where fans showed up to do silly chants about my people. Because um, what we're really reconciling, yes, is residential schools, is yes, all of those policies, but the, the, the truth is what we're reconciling is Canada, the country itself, the state. And what we're reconciling is, should it still exist? That's the question that we actually have to get to. And I, that can seem like a scary statement, but I've just told you we didn't have democracy until like 60 years ago. So it's not that entrenched that we can't change it. And it's not about, you know, you, you've seen friends of mine talk about land back and all of these things, and I know that scares a lot of people. But remember, my ancestors were not about kicking your ancestors out of here. Quite the opposite. In fact, it's so odd to me, because when I think of the state of Canada and whose communities have given the most to make this country a thing, what has my family given to make this country a thing? I would suggest damn near everything. We believed in the vision that we were told. We signed the treaties. My, my community signed a treaty before there was a Canada believing that, that we could live together, that we could share, that this land, if we lived in balance with it, which I gotta tell you we're not, so there is that, and that is going to be part of the restitution that has to be made. Because for, for our communities, the land is our kin, it is our family, and it also requires reconciliation. And probably not just with Canada, with the world, and the systems that we've imposed upon it, but the point is my ancestors believed in this country, this idea that we could make it work. And what did they get for that? Yes, I am the exact product residential schools sought to deliver. An indigenous person who grew up away from their community, not knowing their language, not knowing their cultures, sometimes confused if they even belonged in the indigenous nation their family's been a part of for thousands of years. Who, who on a baseball diamond when they're 10 years old is distinctly told who is us and who is them. Right? But I am also, and, and increasingly as, a, as you know, a man who's getting older, I think I'm beginning to reject that framing of me. And what I want to say instead is that I'm a product of what my great-grandparents, Alex and Maggie Miyawasi, imagined when they sent their daughter to that residential school, which is they imagined that they were empowering their family to learn new skills, to be successful in this new world, so that we may contribute to our community. So yes, I am what the residential schools sought to seek out, but more so because of the way I'm standing here telling this truth to you today, and the fact that I'll tell more truth tomorrow, and I'll continue the fight for my people until I'm unable to, that part is very much the product of what Alex and Maggie Miyawasagi wanted. And the other truth that I would tell to Canada is that if you think my generation are troublemakers, because we've caused a little trouble. We don't like Canada Day, so we don't make it that much fun for everyone. Probably shouldn't be that much fun, hint. Uh, we've, we've made sure that everyone wears orange shirts at least one day a year, right? If, but if you think I'm the guy that's the real troublemaker, uh, I got news for you. I'm very privileged. I get to spend a lot of time. I've got two teenagers, Anishinaabe teenagers, in my house. I get to spend a lot of time with indigenous youth from all sorts of nations. 
if you think I'm someone who tells a lot of truth and isn't looking to put up with things that my previous generations of my family had to put up with, wait till you meet my kids. Because they are not having it. Not a second of it. And they are going to ask all, everyone in this room, everyone watching, they're going to ask you, my kids, your kids, our collective kids, about reconciliation, about a whole host of issues that we're facing right now. I, I suspect many of them are being discussed at this conference. You, you know what they are. They're going to come and ask you what you did about it. What did you do about it? I have an answer. Do you? Does Canada have an answer? Because I'm telling you, not having an answer isn't going to wash with these kids. It's not. They're not looking for it. We debate all this nonsense. It's settled for them. Like, I've had numerous discussions around cultural appropriation. My kids, it's not even an issue. You don't do it. It's done. They've decided. All sorts of these issues that we argue about, that we watch our leaders, I don't know, we make silly nonsense about, the kids don't care. It's already over. So we need to, we need to have an answer for them about what we did. Because what, what are we doing around reconciliation among indigenous people and Canadians, among the environment and capitalism? among any number of these things. What are we doing? What will you answer when your children come and ask you? What did you do about this? And I guess while we reflect, I hope what we reflect on in is what we are going to do and that tomorrow we do it. Miigwech, 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 chi miigwech for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey. Wow. Well, thank you for uh, for that offering, that sharing. I feel like um, there's just a lot of things I didn't wrap my head around in a certain way. Um, so I love that we can just, you know, as long as you live with an open mind and an open heart, we can welcome some lessons like that. So thank you. Uh, everyone enjoyed that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Smiling with your eyes. <laughs> Um, okay, so as you mentioned, you grew up in Toronto. Yeah. You referenced East York. East York, like East York, where? Uh, we grew up like O'Connor behind what was O'Connor Bowl. Do you remember there was a bowling alley? Yes, of course. We grew up on Westview Boulevard, which is like right behind it, and uh, yeah, it was a it was a great place. You know, I I tell the one story about yeah, yeah. it. Otherwise, it was fantastic. <laughs> like it was really just the one incident. For sure. Uh, isn't it funny though that we used to we used to uh, be able to use bowling alleys as landmarks? That's, a, that's no law, that, that doesn't happen anymore. Sadly, I, that's how I still navigate much of the world, which is a challenge, because <laughs> I went recently to East York. That bowling alley is not there anymore. That's what I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it was a bit, bit confusing. But yeah, they had five pin, which is a particular Canadian Love treat. that, love that. Um, OK, so you mentioned East York. Shout out to O'Connor, the bowling alleys, which we, we miss so dearly. Um, did you split time or spend a lot of time on the reserve? No, not really. Um, you, you know, the Serpent River is about an hour and a half west of Sudbury. Mm -hmm. So while it's not a long drive when you're a kid, it certainly seems right. like endless. <laughs> um, we, would, we would go when I was a kid quite often um, to visit and, you know, uh, eat and all the things you would do as a family. My grandmother certainly went back. She just never lived there again. Yeah. Um, we still have family there. I was just there in August. My, um, actually, my grandmother's brother, the last of her generation, just passed in August, oh. uh, my great uncle Art. And so we went there and the whole family was there. But um, I, no, I didn't split. It's never been my home. Okay. But what's interesting is these days it actually feels more home mm. than most other places. What, why is that? I think I'm older. I'm, I think I'm, the city is, uh, I sort of go in and out of love with the city of Toronto these days. Um, and I, I in, increasingly enjoy being on the, on the land. And yeah. when you're there, you're 
being on the land is you walk out your door. And right. so there's something about that that I find um, comforting and it feels, feels sure. good. Um, I know that you, you mentioned uh, like the sound um, from the story that you shared. And I, I wondered, because you said you, there was something that stuck with me. You said, um, we never did it at the dinner table. That would just be weird or different or that just didn't happen. Um, but you said, but you did see it in movies and you did see it. Yeah. And so for me, I think about it, I think about my childhood and I remember that sound. I, I, don't, I obviously didn't know um, what it was trying to say or if it was a negative or a positive, but I just knew that people did it when they were trying to make a certain point. Um, with that said, I want to I want to ask you if you could share with us where you saw yourself represented in media and how and how it was depicted at that time. Well, I mean, at the time, not not much, mm -hmm. you know, because um, uh, most of the media that I would have watched with Indigenous people in it would not have been made by Indigenous people. Correct. Right. So, uh, and we for sure watched. You know, the, the cartoon that always springs to mind is the Bugs Bunny cartoon when he's at the Alamo. Uh, if you've ever seen this one, and he's firing a gun out of the fort and he's just singing a song, one little, two little, three little Indians, and marking them off as he shoots them. Mm. And then he, then he shoots one and he says, oops, that was a half breed and only Rebs. Come on. Yeah, yeah. That, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That was a real reaction. Yeah, no, it's why, it's why they Some don't... Some of the stuff is just so dark back then. Well, why they don't show those cartoons on TV anymore. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, not to pick on Bugs, because that was just, I think, representative of the, the time. Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid, like, the only what I would have thought, thought of as authentic representation was probably Beachcombers, if you remember that show. No, no. Canadian show set on the West Coast, all about forest industry. There was a, an indigenous family with a guy named Jesse on it. Um, so that was about as close. And then in 1984, I saw a movie on TV called uh, Incident at Restigouche by Alanisa Bomsuin, who's like legendary indigenous filmmaker, documentary filmmaker in Canada. And that was the first time, I think, where I saw someone who could have been from my family mm. on TV being themselves. Mm -hmm. And it was that, it was Spike Lee, it was some of those folks that said, maybe I could actually, like maybe there's a place for me in movies that right. isn't the, the dead guy on the horse or, or whatever it would be. Right. It, it, it's so important when you, th when you think about seeing someone of your likeness in positions that are either attractive or powerful, or both. Because I know for sure that had a huge impact on my life. Like, I just didn't really see it too often. Even though, you know, we talk, we talk about how diverse the city is, and I praise the city for being so diverse. Um, my, my Instagram name is Mr. One Love T.O. Um, but there was something that Mr. Tori said today. He said, we are, on paper, factually, the most diverse city, but we have to work towards being the most inclusive. City. And I thought, well, <laughs> well, Mayor Tory, <laughs> click, 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 because uh, that's exactly what we're talking about. I'm going to come back. To, I, have, yeah. I have too many questions. I started writing down my own questions, but um, I don't want to hug it. If there is some audience questions, let's include them before our time is up. Any questions in the audience? Oh, all right. You can go ahead and yell it out. I got really good hearing. Ooh, take two steps forward and say that again, brother. He, he asked, <laughs> what, in, in terms of truth and reconciliation, what are some steps Canadians can take right. to move forward? Is, That's that, it. is that basically, I got it right. Thank you. Um, I get asked that a lot. Um, you know, you know I, think, I think the most important thing in any sort of cultural shift, which is really what we're talking about, mm. um, is that it's not ever going to be governments or institutions that do that. They just don't ever, they're really big beasts and they don't switch. What, what makes social change, and the example I often use is um, marriage equality, which for the vast majority of my life wasn't an acceptable thing, and then it seemed almost overnight, although it totally was not overnight. Right, right. Suddenly 
you probably can't get elected in Canada if you run against marriage equality. That's not a, again, politicians didn't decide that. We decided that. And we made it that it was impossible for them to do that. And so that's why I say the first thing we can do is look at yourself, your own self, look at how, you know, your, if you can, any biases you may have created, what do you know about indigenous, like you personally know about indigenous people? I've mentioned the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. You, there's a great, a few different apps, whoseland.ca is one, that where you will use your GPS to tell you whose land you're on <laughs> and tell you which treaty you are on, because there are lots of treaties. There's one in where we are sitting right now that you are a part of because of your presence here. Whether you or your ancestors ever signed it, you're still a part of it. Um, start learning, listening to our stories. Because I think, you know, when I think about, and the reason why that baseball anecdote sticks, sticks with me, mm -hmm. is because what were we seeing there? We were seeing a taunt by kids who had heard one story being felt by a kid who knew a totally different story. And this is still Canada, where we have myths or these ideas that have come up about these communities. And it's not just with indigenous people, literally any marginalized community this happens with. But with those of us that have been here long, it's just been going on for a very long time, and it becomes foundational. Part of the problem is Canadians don't know us, even though we've been here for so long. Um, that is a pur also purposeful, right? There were laws passed to keep us from telling our stories. The potlatch ban being the most famous one from 1884 to 1951. Most Canadians don't know that that was a law. We were literally not allowed to dance or practice our ceremonies. Mm -hmm. It was against the law. So that's why they took all the artifacts at that time. That's why storytelling has been my focus. A, because I'm a movie geek and I don't know anything else to do. But um, to me, there's a storytelling gap in Canada between what is the truth and like what is the actual history of this place and what everyone has learned. Right. And until we can fill that gap, it's hard for us to be fully human and we have issues that present themselves that are real life and death stuff. 100%. I realize that I need, to, I need to talk to you for like an hour, but I'm going to keep it to the clock. But um, when you talk about storytelling, yeah. now, I, that's all I want to do moving forward, especially after what's happened in the last 18 months. I just want to tell stories. Um, how important is it to tell stories or use storytelling um, to, to, to reclaim the history of, of all marginalized groups? I mean, I think it's fundamental, right? I don't, humans as a species, we're the storytelling species. What separates us from the other animals right. is we have to tell stories. Our brain, the catch-22 of our brain is that it has to rationalize everything, and so it tells stories literally about everything in our life. <laughs> Even math is a, like one plus one is a story. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Wolves, if you've ever encountered a wolf, they're not telling a lot of stories because <laughs> they're pretty clear on what it is to be a wolf. Like, they're not that confused about it. Right. Humans have a brain that tricks us and we get confused. And so um, we rationalize everything with storytelling. And so I think, but the key is not just storytelling full stop. It's authentic storytelling that comes from those communities because the, this, the reality of even this conference, the, of the, the discourse we're having in Canada today, is not because non-Indigenous people suddenly started waking up to these stories. It's that our communities started telling them right. and started telling them forcefully, and that's what we ultimately need, right? So, because you mentioned um, just now, you said that Indigenous folks have been telling this story. Um, so. And then you also mentioned, you used the word accepted. It's now finally being accepted, a very particular. Um, why? Why is that? Like, oh, what is it? Like, you know, I can think about like the Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, boom, George Floyd. Now, nobody can't look away. Why? Yeah, and I mentioned Spike Lee, and Spike Lee literally made a movie about police brutality yeah. against his community yeah. in the 80s. Yeah maybe the greatest American movie ever made, certainly up on the high list, and yet, so there you go. He yeah. told the story and we, I think it's, 
I would suggest that was an acceptance issue, mm. is that when Spike told that story, the vast majority of non-black Americans weren't ready to accept it right. as being true. It, I think what George Floyd did, you know, in that tragedy, I think it becomes overwhelming. Like it, and I think for, for First Nations folks, we're just hitting that point now. Mm -hmm. and, but I do worry that like, we need the storytelling to actually, just telling the story, if it doesn't change minds and gets us to a different place. Because all the momentum that I felt last summer, I'm not sure I feel it this summer. Oh, you don't feel it, sir. This is what I'm respect. saying. Yeah. And yet we know our cousins are still dying. Yeah. And police are still involved in their deaths. Yeah. Like there was a time last year in Canada when more indigenous people had been killed by cops than COVID. So like, this is something our communities share because of course police were literally established to police us, not really oh much else. God. I ended up learning about the history of police, why the police was even established in the first place. Well, there, it, the, it's, what a, the it's a combo platter of, of catching for, for escaped <laughs> slaves and, and oppressing indigenous people. It's like, how can we mix those together? And this is modern policing still unfortunately presents and that's because it's roots, that's where they are. And, it, right. and that is why when we talk about why I think there's real validity and we really have to look at things like defund the police or what I'm saying is look at Canada itself is because these are, it's not so much rotten fruit, it's the tree itself is poisoned right. and we need to be adults and say, can we not meet and figure out how this works? And I think the, the bigger part of, of all of these movements is our communities with social media and all sorts of different, are started to tell our stories, have started to make it hard to deny them, and also have helped make us fully human in a way that marginalized communities struggle. And that's why actually representation and all those things, because representation without agency isn't particularly useful, except that it can start the process of getting people to see you as fully human. Yeah. And, and, you know, my community, your community, we're not just trauma. We're also a ton of joy and happiness and all this sort of stuff. We don't get to display that. That is not seen by everyone. And that allows all sorts of pernicious stuff to keep occurring. And we need to, you know, as I often say, we need to flood this place with our stories yeah. so that we can build something new. Well. Um, if we weren't still in the pandemic, he would have dropped the mic at that point. But uh, for now, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I honestly, literally, was, as I was watching you, uh, I don't know how many questions I wrote. I probably asked three of them. But you know, I, I look forward to listening to all your contributions. Uh, please stay, stay abreast with our friends here. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.